Welcome to 101, a podcast for young women interested in careers in film and TV. We'll sit down with industry professionals, ask them your questions, and get the answers you need to know. 101, it's, it's a beginning. beginning. We are here with Superwoman Naomi McDougal Jones. I, I, you know, Naomi, I didn't know, like, I was prepping for this and I'm like, I'm not sure how to introduce you because you do so many <laughs> amazing things. Yeah. So I figured like we could just kind of introduce you and then you can introduce you. <laughs> you're, you're tossing the problem onto me, I see. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I think that you have a, a, a better way of, of mapping it out for our listeners. It's a good problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so I, I've taken to, to basically two titles, which is storyteller and change maker. Um, so on the storytelling front, I make movies. I'm a writer, actress, producer. I also write books um, and do other things in the storytelling ways. And then as a change maker, I have traveled the world speaking about the problems of women, with the, the problems of the lack of women in film, not the problems created by women in film. And I wrote a book about that and I did a TED talk that went viral and I um, founded the 51 Fund, which is a private equity fund to finance films by female filmmakers. And I founded Avalon Story, which is a place to incubate both stories and business models that can lead us into a more beautiful future and a more beautiful system and regenerative system for storytelling where maybe toxicity isn't baked into the DNA, but is actually the DNA is, is hopeful and joyful and regenerative and healthy. Um, and I also recently became certified as a death doula, which is a bit of a tangent for this podcast. So we can talk about that if you want. I mean, I think we have to now. <laughs> so. yeah. It's a pretty interesting one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that cup more or less covers it. I mean, I'm not sure how to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> that you do a lot of stuff. Any threat, oh yeah. my gosh, you do a lot of stuff. <laughs> I did see your TED talk. And if you haven't seen it, we'll put a link on our uh, on our website and all sure. of our contact stuff. Um, it is wonderful. It's one of the things that I, I was just like so inspired by when I was put in touch with you through mutual friends. What do you feel like you are first? Is there something that you feel like you are definitely all the time, you know, in your life, I am definitely a writer all the time, or I am definitely this? I think it it's storyteller. My mom tells the story that when I was four years old, she took me to see the Nutcracker. And in the middle of the second act, I stood up on my seat and said, I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and for a while, when I was a kid, I thought that meant ballet, which I did for 18 years. But it it isn't really. I think what I felt in that theater, even at four years old, was the ability of story to reach people and to like transform their insides. Um, and so from the beginning, that's the thing I knew I had to be part of. So when I'm writing, acting, you know, I'm getting to, even producing, I'm getting to like live those stories in a different way, getting to weave them, getting to bring them into the world whether through my words or my body or whatever. And then the women in film stuff has honestly just grown up because <laughs> there's really systemic sexism and racism and all these things baked into this, like the, mo the loudest megaphone through which we get to transmit stories. And so um, knowing and viscerally feeling how power, how much power stories have when I began to realize how limited uh, the, the, number of people who have that megaphone are, I knew that 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 also had to be part of my work to change that or be a small part of changing it. Do you think that one has informed the other and vice versa in how you've grown as an artist? Absolutely. It's really important to me to always protect my own art practice, partly because it's the thing that feeds me the most. It's my own body's communication with the universe. Without that, I would feel really um, like desiccated. And something I've observed in some people who get caught by activism is that they actually stop their own art practice and, and their whole identity becomes the activism. And I think the danger in that it is triplicate. On, in, on the one hand, because your identity becomes wrapped up in fighting this problem, um, your identity only can be sustained if the problem continues. So it's actually bad for you if the problem gets solved. 
I would be so delighted if this problem got solved <laughs> tomorrow, right? Because because uh, all I actually want to be doing is is my art practice, um, and I do this out of service and necessity and whatever. But but it, that's that feels really important to me to not have the problem be my identity. I think the other danger is there's a vulnerability to being an artist and to to continually <laughs> whether whether you're alone in your office in the morning with the blank page or you're at the point of putting it in front of other people there's an intense vulnerability that exists in very few other things and i think the more you work in this business and you get away from that feeling of vulnerability the easier it is to become toxic or to become cruel or to become um to like get high on power um because you forget what it feels like to be an artist and i never never <laughs> want that I never want to forget. I never want to know in my own body what it's like to wake up each morning with that and sit down with a blank page and go through the brain thing of like, you definitely don't know how to write. You probably never knew how to write. You definitely have forgotten this morning if you ever knew. And like, you know, that that's an important thing to remember. The vulnerability is such, it's such a key part of what we do and nobody talks about it. Everybody like pushes that away. Yeah, it's just something that you naturally have to figure out or cross that hurdle every time it happens, you know, and it's a lot. You cross that hurdle every time you create something. Every time. We're in an industry where we're telling stories. We're trying to showcase all these different people in real life situations. And yet day to day, we can't even come to reality with the issues that are happening within the industry. It is. I was saying before you got on, I did the math. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Ago. And if, if we continue the change at the pace we're moving, it will take 289 years to get to parity, which is too long for my time. <laughs> so we really need to come up with some radical ways of making it go faster. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I was so excited <laughs> that she did the math. I was like, that is something that everybody needs to know. And it needs to be out there because, I mean, we felt the same way we saw the uh celluloid ceiling i think it was 2020 and we were just like beyond devastated because we thought that like so much was happening and and it was not (laughs) well and this is the real danger right as as someone who lived very much in the like the maelstrom of me too and you know that's when my ted talk went viral and the whole thing there was this feeling that something different was happening Mm -hmm. and that you know, everybody was talking about it. There was all this pressure and, th- and all of that was true, right? That, that, and it did change some things. However, mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of what happened was, um, you know, studios putting out press releases, um, being like, <laughs> Fox solves its woman problem, you know? And then you read the article and it's like, they're, they've started a program to give one female filmmaker a grant to direct a short film. <laughs> You know, yeah. they're like, whoa. Yeah. So yeah. there's there was a lot of sort of scramble to to fix the optics of it and a real lack of desire to actually try to dig deep and fix the problems. Um, speaking broadly, there are certainly pockets where deeper change happened. Um, but the stats on screen have moved to the most. So mm-hmm. like the number of women in uh, lead roles, the number of people of color in lead, lead roles, those things have changed the fastest. But behind this camera, the numbers have bi- only wiggled, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. um, which to me is a really big problem because the on-screen is the most visible to the consumer. Exactly. Um, and they don't really understand how movies get made anyway. It's sort of like a magic box. Um, and so they're like, oh yes, this we're hearing different stories. We're seeing different stories. But actually, we're seeing more stories through the same white male gaze, for the most part. Uh, and to me, that's almost even more dangerous because people kind of go, "Oh, well, it's all changing." Like it'll just kind of there's there's a feeling like, "Well, it's changed a little, so now it'll just keep changing." And if you look actually at the trajectory of how this has gone, the opposite happens. <laughs> so, like yeah. this happened at the end of the '70s, and there was a similar thing. There wasn't. Twitter, so it wasn't quite as big, but it was similar sort of moment. Um, And the numbers jumped up. And then 
they went up for a couple of years and then they actually started backsliding and they never went back to as low as they were before, but then they flatlined for about 25 years. There was that group of uh, directors, the female directors of the DGA. Yep. That, that, the original six. That's yep. right. That's right. It comes up, I think in this changes everything. That yeah, they talk about I think that's what it was. Yeah, but it's like, we're just repainting a wall, but everything behind that wall is rotting. That's a fantastic yeah. analogy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and I don't want to discourage people too much. Like there was progress, no. right? Like if, if we think about this as sort of a battle, like we moved forward, whatever, a hundred feet, which is not as much as we need to move, but the danger is complacency now, right? Like we got, we made some headway. There's going to be backsliding. There already is. Um, now we need to keep pushing forward. I feel yeah. like we could talk in this direction for like ever, <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to, we're going to kind of go back to, uh, some like really basic and accessible questions for our listeners. What we like to highlight is that everybody has a different journey in this industry and there isn't one way to do things, uh, which is actually fits really nicely into our, our conversation that we just had. Meredith, do you want to tackle some of the questions? Yeah. I want to know like what your first gig was in this industry and, and how you got it and how it went. <laughs> do you mean like the first time I got paid to do something or what? I mean, I, I've been in, I was in the Nutcracker the next year when I was five. So wh amazing where, as where a dancer, as a ballerina, Yeah, yeah. as a, as a small mouse, I believe. Yes. That, well, that's the entry level or, position for the it Nutcracker. Is, or, it might've been a gingerbread child. <laughs> one of the two yeah <laughs> you could even talk about like maybe the first production that you made yourself and like and what oh, roles sure. you took on in that project um yeah that's that thank you for that um, yeah nudge that's great uh so I I went to Cornell University um which was kind of a funny thing so in high school I knew I wanted to go to school to for acting because that was what I was doing at that point and um, I was the valedictorian in my high school class. So all the adults in my life were like, you can't just go to an acting school. My, my parents actually weren't like this, but everybody else was like, you can't just go to an acting school. You have to like go to a real university and get, and you can do theater there, but you must get a liberal arts degree. And so I applied to 10 different colleges and I got rejected from nine of them, which made sense to nobody. The only place I got into was Cornell, and like, which is like an Ivy League school, and I had gotten rejected from all these like way worse schools. It was very it's crazy. Yeah, it's so weird. So I went to Cornell, um, and it was an acting major. But in my dormitory, I got into the weird theater kids dormitory, which was like not everyone was a theater kid. It was just the it was mostly the weird kids dormitory. <laughs> It was, it, it was, it was built to look like a castle and the, <laughs> you, and the dining room was built <clears throat> to look like the dining hall in Oxford, which is also where they the shot Hogwarts. Harry Potter. Yeah. So our, our dining room was Hogwarts. I was in, this was like one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me. But also because it was just like, I had been the weird kid in my small town in Colorado and he, getting here, I was like, oh my God, like these people are way weirder than I am. This is fantastic. <laughs> it was like, they totally moved the Overton window. Um, and in that dormitory, there was a theater uh, that was run by the residents. And so what I was like, but I have a theater. And so out of what hubris, I have no idea, but I was like, I'll just put on plays in this theater. <laughs> so I, I was only at Cornell for one year because then I ended up actually transferring to an acting conservatory in New York, which was great. But in within that year, I, I put produced three plays <laughs> and it was such a beautiful thing. And it was such a, I guess it was kind of seminal in all of this because it was just like, there, there was no reason we couldn't do it. Like everyone wanted to be in them. Everyone had to, wanted to come see them. We had a theater, <laughs> there was just no barrier. And I feel like th that, that experience that year really cemented in my mind. Like, if you don't know how to do it, you just figure it out. Like you just keep asking questions until you know what you're doing. That's amazing. It was really over ambitious now that I'm. <laughs> <laughs> so you were like the writer, director, producer in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. And did you act in that too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't so that's I directed all of them. I definitely directed one of them. Whatever. <laughs> but yes, 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 yes. It was a lot. <laughs> so that's when it began, like all the rules, you know. Yeah. Cool. What's the best part of your job? 
well, okay, possibly my favorite moment in the universe is the first day on set of a movie I've written. Because inevitably, I've spent like three to five years <laughs> working on this screenplay alone in my office, and then later with collaborators and whatever. But like going through this very painful, isolated process, like pulling this thing into existence and dreaming up these characters and the whole thing. And then one day, <laughs> a very magical day, I walk onto a set and there's like a hundred other grown people like pretending with me, like they're building the world that came out of my head and they're making props because I wrote them on a page and they're becoming human beings that have only existed in my brain until that point. And there's this beautiful thing where uh, because I act in my films, I just walk onto set as an actor, right? And it's like this whole thing that has been mine goes like, Poof! and is suddenly everybody's and it's so much bigger than me. And I'm just like this one tiny piece in it. It's the coolest feeling in the world. Yeah. And then sitting in an audience, in an audience, listening to them laugh at your movie, at jokes you wrote like that. So many things. It was cool that you mentioned like all of these, like hundreds of grown people just they're all building this thing. It seems like you really value the people that are working on that project with you. They all make it better. Like this is the, the, the sublime thing about film is that it is a medium that begins with one person having an idea for a story. And then it like gets put through this magic box where like <laughs> over a hundred people all do their tiny little piece of this thing and it comes out the other end of that box feeling like a cohesive story told by one person when it works, which is not always, but like, but that should never work. Like that is crazy. <laughs> How does that ever work? But there's no other art form like that. So, and it, it's like, and each of those people bring their, ma their own special magic to whatever, even if they're like making a prop and it's become so much more than any one person could create. It's amazing. Yeah, that's what we love. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> um, do we stay on the high lovey-dovey stuff or do we go to the, the dark? I'm very good at swinging uh, back and forth so we can, okay. we can take so, a journey. <laughs> we'll, we'll go, we'll go, but we'll come back quick. So what would you say is the most difficult part of your job? Films take forever under almost every set of circumstances. Um, I've never not had a film take forever. And there's a very particular period of time in the, let's say, three to 10 year span before you've actually gotten to set, where the high of sort of how great you think your screenplay is, isn't enough to sustain you anymore. And like the, the high of collecting your, your initial core team and then being excited isn't quite sustaining and everyone's getting a little worried that this might not ever actually happen. And it's not inevitable yet that the film actually will occur. <laughs> but you've put, again, let's say three to five years in up until that point and so much love and blood and sweat and tears. And that is a very particularly hard moment to hold the faith. Um, and I think that's the hardest because anything like whatever happens when you're on set, whatever happens when you're in post-production, like the biggest catastrophe can happen. You're still making your movie. It's like when it might not happen. That to me is the hardest. How do you keep going? <sighs> Chocolate. I, <don't... laughs> I mean, what else do you do? Like, yeah. I'm not going to go become a banker at this point. It, like... <laughs> because I remember what it feels like to be on set in that first moment. <laughs> you know, I have a friend who says some days you just need to go do a jigsaw puzzle. And I think that's, that's also <laughs> like some days you have to be like, I can't fight this. I yeah. Can't fight brain this. refresh. I need to go do a jigsaw yeah. puzzle. Today. Everybody. I mean, all three of us. And I think a lot of our listeners know how hard it is to pull it off. Um, oh, yeah. and it is hard, but I will say it is possible. And we've all done it. So you guys can do it too. It is. And I will say making a film is simply an exercise in solving an endless series of problems. And if you're anywhere near the beginning and you look at the top of the mountain, you will sit down and cry and you will never continue. But if you just keep solving the next thing, you will eventually have a movie that is actually inevitable as long as you stick with it. I, I love that. It's true. So 
one of the things that we want to normalize in the industry is uh, women talking about money and women talking about what they deserve to be paid and how to determine when to maybe make a little bit less, establishing their own rules for how they manage themselves and like how you've navigated that part of the business because it is business. Like I said, we want our listeners to feel empowered to ask for what they deserve to, you know, know how to navigate. If it's like an indie film and, you know, the producers aren't paying themselves and like, when do you push? When do you not push? Yeah. If you can just share some insight. Sure. I mean, I will say that there's a quality to this industry and maybe this is true of every industry, but it's certainly true of this one where the, the, the more I love to do a thing, the less I, it is possible to get paid to do it. <laughs> um, so I used to have a rubric for myself of like what had to be true to take a project across different jobs and things. So like producing, I hate producing as a, as a thing, right? Unto itself, right? It's a giant pain in the ass. Um, I like producing my own films in conjunction with producing teammates because then you get it's about getting to build your own playground. But as like producing other people's stuff, I loathe as basically. So like it, it to do that, I, I have to get paid very well because then it's really about a paycheck. To act, <laughs> if, if I love the project, I will act and I will still act in almost anything for free unless, but, but hold that thought because it's about who's getting paid what in the whole constellation of things. So as a writer, um, if I'm writing my own stuff, I usually do that for free. Initially, so far, I've mostly gotten paid later, like when we've raised budgets for films. Um, because uh, I always have more of my own ideas to write than I have time to write them. If I'm going to take time off to write some of my own writing to write other people's things, I must be compensated well um, for that as well, because that, that there's a there's an opportunity cost to what I'm losing um, for of my own work. It's very tricky, right? My, my personal philosophy has honestly mostly been how can I figure out how to get paid for other things that are like flexible and that I like doing so that I can just do whatever the hell I want creatively and not have to worry about getting paid for that. That's not awesome, but that, <laughs> I mean, it's not awesome that I shouldn't be getting paid for the value I'm bringing to the world, but also we're in late stage capitalism. Our value propositions are very off. I don't know. That's how I've made it work for myself. As a coach, now that I'm, a lot of my income comes from teaching and coaching other filmmakers, um, I have to get paid $200 an hour to do that, just again, because of the opportunity cost of the time I'm losing from my own work. Like, that's just what I've figured out. I have to get paid to make the whole thing work. And I've been very poor for a lot of years. So I, I graduated from acting school in 2008. So at about 15 years, sheesh. <laughs> I've been in this business for about 15 years. I like the way that you organize your uh, your time. And I think it's it's important to to balance out time and also skills. So if you are passionate about something, then maybe you'll you'll be willing to take a little bit less because it's not like an exact science. And I think that's the tricky thing with the business. Um, you know, my mentor, when I was only acting, um, I'm, I'm like, what, how do I determine whether or not I should push? Because I was at that stage in my career where I was like, I don't, you know, I'm okay with doing things for free. And, you know, I was happy for the learning experience and to like act and use my, my skills and my talent. Um, but I never knew like when to push. And somebody was like, well, if you're really passionate about it, then that's one thing. If it's just a money job, that's okay too. But it's also like, he said, like, look to see if the producers are getting paid. And like, you touched on that a little bit. I think it's such an important thing as a producer as well, because I've produced things where people are like pushing me for money. I'm like, guys, like, we don't have it. But, you know, I think it's an important conversation to have. And I think you really covered it nicely. I do think there's a conversation you have to have with yourself too, about what matters. Mm -hmm. Like, was it, 
uncomfortable to live on $20,000 for 12 years. Yup. Like, were there a lot of sacrifices I had to make in my quality of living? Yup. But to me, that was less important than what than getting to do the thing that I feel I was put on this earth to do in the way I wanted to do it. The reason I, this is bad, I said, I don't want to reinforce the starving artist model because I think we need to get out of that. However, there is a reality that, again, like the divergence between what you love doing and the way you love doing it and getting paid can be vast. You need to get paid and, and you need to live and like, where's where's what's your number that is enough to be okay? Where beyond that, you can do what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. And it, it obviously depends on where you live. Oh, hello, Carrie. Oh, um, hey. hello, dog number one. <laughs> she knows she's on camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi. <laughs> what advice have you been given or advice that you can give to our listeners? Maybe somebody who hasn't gotten into the industry yet or people that are in the industry that are losing track of what's important. If you look at the most successful people in our industry, a lot of them are deeply fucking miserable. <laughs> I, I would venture to say most of them are deeply miserable, which really has to give one pause, I think, about chasing metrics of success that we're told are important. I am a lot less successful than a lot of people. I'm also more successful than a lot of people. But I am really happy doing what I'm doing <laughs> on a day to day basis. I think about co creating my career with the universe. And what I mean by that is like, there are the things each year or decade that I think I want to have happen. And I sort of like go after those things. But I think I've also been very good of when something else happens, inevitably, <laughs> I've been very open to being like, okay, well, what's this? And, and, and sort of like pursuing the day-to-day -day life that I want and letting go of some of the bigger success markers that I thought were important before. And so I often joke that my career has been kind of like that magician, the magic trick with the handkerchiefs and the hat where the magician like has a volunteer and they say, pull this handkerchief out of the hat and then it's connected to another one. I'm going to like, that's how my whole career has felt. It's like, this is very surprising. <laughs> but it's also been amazing so far. And I think it will continue to be amazing. And like, if I think about what I thought I wanted when I was 18, I thought I wanted to be an Oscar winning actress and just be an actress and like, and that hasn't happened. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But I also like, my brain wasn't big enough to imagine the career I have had. And it's so much cooler than that. Like I've gotten to do so many more cool things. So co-create your career with the universe. Like know what you want, take steps, but also be, pay attention to what's showing up and, and, what, and what may be presenting itself that's actually cooler than you could have imagined cooler than you ever imagined. <laughs> I think though there's like, there's this amazing component of what we do that it's really accessible. Like everybody, everybody feels like they know what goes into making a movie or like what it means to be an actor. You know, some of my favorite questions when I was just starting out is like, you know, oh, what's, what have you been in? And you're just like, <sighs> people feel like they can ask you those questions and it's fine. But like, if someone's an accountant, they're not like, Oh, how was last March? How was last right. April? Like, have you done any tax forms recently? <laughs> it's like, it's the same. Like they don't, yeah. you know, any yeah. good audits lately. It's, you know, as a young artist, like it is hard. And, you know, even, even as a mature artist, like, you know, I've had people ask me about different projects and like, whatever happened with that. And you're just like, uh, you know, we went on to make $650 million. Didn't you see? <laughs> yeah. It's the nature of a really like visible, accessible industry yeah. that people think they know a lot about, but unfortunately, like they, they only know a little bit about. Yeah. I, for any young artists out there who are getting asked the question, have I seen you in anything? Oh, have I seen you anything? My best answer that I discovered is, oh, I don't know. What do you watch? And their brains go, well, 
And nice. most of them were like, I don't know, we mostly watched Dancing with the Stars. And I'm like, oh, then probably not. Yeah, Time no. to bet on that one. <laughs> I like that. That's a, that's a good one. It's funny. I have a friend that works on the set of Dancing with the Stars. So he does the set building. <laughs> that's yeah. amazing. So for people who are just starting out, like maybe they know a little bit about the industry, maybe they're in school, like what kind of guidance would you give to getting that first job or like what resources do you think uh, are helpful or have been helpful to you? I mean, you just kind of throw spaghetti at the wall. <laughs> like just, I feel like I was like a Tasmanian devil coming out of sc school. I was just like, I was like, whatever, like, just like, get me on a set, get me to meet people. Yeah. Um, now, I took some exploitative jobs that I wouldn't take again, and maybe try not to try to avoid those. But I do think it's just about starting somewhere. And I think people can get a little bit caught up at the beginning and like, oh, well, it needs to be the right thing or whatever. And like, you're going to work on some shitty things. Just it's kind of you kind of got to get them out of your system. <laughs> you know? And I will say that some of the shittiest projects I worked on, I met some of the best people that I still work with because they were just starting out too. So ju just like work as much as you can, collect the good people, right? Like have literally take notes, like who are the great, talented, good people you find? And then eventually start making work with those people. I feel like that's a lame answer, but that is- I think that's, that's a great that's answer. No, I think it's a great answer um, because it's true. Like everybody's been in that play where they serve drinks with your ticket. <laughs> You're like, oh, it's You were in that play bucks. too? Yeah, and uh, it comes with a jug of like <laughs> margaritas, but it's true. And, you know, it's funny that you say that because when I did that margarita play, I met the guy who was then the lead in my first feature film. And yeah. There you go. Everyone at the beginning is so worried about networking up. Like everyone is trying to meet somebody who like is higher up in the industry than they are. And that is, I mean, fine, try. But actually the most important networking at the beginning is sideways because those are the people who are going to grow up and become casting directors, become producers. You're going to make stuff together. You're going to like the, the people who have given the, me the opportunities in my career have for the most part been my peers. There are a couple of exceptions, people who did reach down and pluck me up. But for the most part, those people don't have time for you because you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> like go get some experience find out what you're doing meet good people around you and like cut your teeth and then maybe those people will want to talk to you yeah 10 years ago I knew nobody and now you know we we each have our own networks and it's people that you can rely on that you can reach out to it's mm -hmm. it feels good it feels good to get to that point but you, you yeah. can't get there until you really bust your ass a little bit <laughs> yeah. yeah and like particularly at the beginning, show up on time, work hard, be nice to people. Mm -hmm. Like that's basically, and then you will get hired again. That's really. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's an ongoing note. Like be on time. <laughs> when you are new and people are like, really people look at that. They're like, is this person on time? Are they always coming in, you know, 15 minutes late with a coffee? And you're like, yeah, right. Yeah, if you don't have a resume, you better be on time. <laughs> yeah. If you want a Starbucks, get up earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go support a local coffee maker, guys. Oh, yeah. That too. Okay. That too. Okay. Okay. I think we're on to the, the final we are master on question. Final, um, final question. Okay. So are there any directors or films that you've um, watched over the years that have inspired you or inspired the work that you create? Knowing you were going to ask this question, I very cleverly wrote down names on a note card because in I always freeze at this question and I can never remember a single name in the entire universe I know it happens it's the list. hardest it is the hardest thank you it shouldn't be yeah. I just like it's some I panic and every name of every human being in the entire world goes out <laughs> <laughs> okay so here here's my list so Celine Sciamma portrait of a lady on fire probably number one holy shit uh D Reese uh Mudbound and Pariah Sarah Polly, Take mm -hmm. This Waltz, um, and also everything else she's ever done, but I just watched that one recently. Um, Mati Diop, Atlantique. Um, 
Rebecca Thomas, Electric Children. Kitty Green, Casting Jean Benet. So she also directed The Assistant, which is the one she's better known for, but I think Casting Jean Benet is one of the coolest movies I've ever seen, and more people should see it. And then last night I watched a film by a first time director that the 51 Fund actually financed her film. And I just got to see the first cut and her name is Noura Niasari and her film is Shada. And I swear to God, this is one of my favorite films now. I sobbed through the entire thing and I- That's so cool. Well, congratulations to her, yeah. Congratulations to her, congratulations to you you guys. That's uh, the big accomplishment. Um, We will also post these on our website uh, so people can do a little research and check these out. Naomi, thank you so much. This has been just pure joy. It was wonderful talking to you and just hearing about your experiences and what's next. Um, I think wonderful things and I think things are going to change. Thank you. Thank you. This was such a delightful conversation. And thank you for doing what you're doing. It's important work. She's amazing. Yeah, no, I really like how she's taking the time to really like reflect. It's very interesting because we haven't had somebody like that before. Mm -mm. The stat that she gave, like I, she said that to me early in the conversation and I was like, oh my God, you've done the math. That's amazing. Yeah. (laughs) It is like, you know, 283 years or something like that. And oh yeah, I'll wait. Yeah. 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 It's going to be like, okay, I'll be like 350 years old directing a film. Yeah, if only I was a a witch and I live forever, but...